Okay. Thank you. So we need to go to Walmart and uh, Subway, I think. That's, that's what we hear there. Okay. Uh, it's our privilege to have a fellow Rotarian and State Senator Art Rush introduce our guest for today. Thank you, Steve. Um, 30 or 35 years ago, when I was a young attorney practicing law here in Vermilion, our uh, offices were up over the National Bank of South Dakota building at that time, which is what's, where Red Steakhouse is now. And we did a lot of work for and with the National Bank of South Dakota. And I got to know a young lawyer who worked for the National Bank of South Dakota who came down to Vermilion on a regular uh, basis to work with us on some of the issues that we were dealing with. And eventually, about 1990, that lawyer left the National Bank of South Dakota, but I've followed his career at a distance. He went to work for the Children's Home Society in uh, Sioux Falls, which is a nonprofit there that works with uh, uh, children with emotional, behavioral, and physical uh, problems. And um, he was involved with that for, for 20 years and eventually was the CEO of uh, Children's Home Society. And I also saw that he got involved in, in politics and was elected as a state senator uh, there in Minnehaha County and served eight years and then served eight years as the lieutenant governor and is now in his seventh year as uh, governor of South Dakota. Uh, he is um, um, one year left in this term before his, his terms term limited uh, in South Dakota. And I would like to uh, introduce our 37th governor of the state of South Dakota. And by the way, his wife Linda is also here today. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Linda is uh, going to suffer along with me all afternoon, so I'm glad, uh, but I'm glad she's here with me. Uh, I also want to say a special hello to my former high school classmate, Nancy Rasmussen, the our, uh, member in the House of Representatives from this district, happened to be a high school classmate of mine, and I was glad to see her get elected. She does a great job, as does Senator Rush. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, economic development uh, here and in the rest of the state, how things are going there, and then talk a little bit about education and workforce. Uh, first of all, uh, about e economic development, uh, when people around the country think about South Dakota, they generally think of Mount Rushmore, of course, and we're certainly proud to be home of that masterpiece. But the truth is, we're much more than the stone carvings out in the West. Uh, we're a great place to do business. And I know many of the Rotarians here are in business, and uh, I just want to reassure you that uh, when I get around the country and I talk to other governors around the country, I'm very proud of South Dakota. I think our business environment is very much envied by uh, business people around the nation and appreciated by those who do business in multiple places, including South Dakota. This year, uh, CNBC named us second in the nation for business friendliness. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation has ranked us first in the nation for our regulatory environment and our business policies and climate. Also, this year, Site Selection uh, published their American Dream Index and found South Dakota the number one state for achieving the American dream. So uh, you don't have to take my word for it. Obviously, at least three others think that South Dakota is a pretty good place. And I certainly agree with them. We're seeing success in South Dakota be because we believe in allowing businesses to prosper and we recognize the importance of having a good economy and, and uh, job opportunity for people. Of course, we, you know we have no corporate income tax, no personal income tax or business inventory tax or business franchise tax. We have a franchise tax on banks, but that's about it. Uh, you know, when uh, other states like Texas, you know, they make much of the fact that they don't have an income tax on their businesses, but they do have a business privilege tax, which if you really look at it, is a business income tax labeled differently. So uh, 
Our tax environment's good, but things are also impressive when you look at actually doing business in South Dakota. The costs of doing business are low. Utility costs, unemployment insurance costs, workers' comp costs, land costs, they're low. And the productivity of our workers is very high. Uh, there's much uh, said about the Midwestern work ethic, and it does exist, and it does uh, stand out. Again, when you talk to employers who have business operations in multiple states, they'll often say that of all their locations, their South, South Dakota location is the most productive. And our government works too. Uh, almost a dozen states began the fiscal year, this fiscal year, July 1st, with no budget. They had no budget. They hadn't gotten it together. Illinois had gone almost two years without a full year state budget. Just multiple month long extensions. Um, South Dakota adopted our budget last March, uh, several months ahead of the beginning of the year. And that's, that's the way we should do things. That's the way we always do things in South Dakota. And when we balance our budget, we don't employ accounting gimmicks. We don't accelerate income into this year to make us look balanced. We don't defer expenses into next year to make us look balanced. We don't use one-time dollars to pay for a cost that's going to recur annually because we know that just defers a problem. We use only recurring income to cover recurring expenses. And we never issue general obligation bonds, unlike Illinois, for example, is, is going to be issuing a, a, some more general obligation bonds to pay for ongoing immediate expenses. Be like going to your credit card to pay your electric bill. Uh, it can work for a while, but after a while, your credit card company, just like your bond uh, purchasers, might start to say, well, we want a little more income a little more interest because of the risks you present. Far too many other states have long-term liabilities. They have unfunded pension plans. Illinois is like that. New Jersey, Connecticut, Kentucky, uh, Louisiana are, are really in deep trouble. Kentucky is uh, looking at a special session to deal with their pension problems. They also have large general obligation liabilities. I used Illinois a minute ago. In South Dakota, we have neither of those things. Um, and other states will eventually be forced to confront those. Unlike Detroit, which declared bankruptcy to deal with their large unfunded pension liabilities, states cannot declare bankruptcy under current law. They cannot. And so they'll eventually have to raise taxes or cut other expenses to cover those deferred liabilities. But South Dakota, we, uh, we don't have unfunded liabilities. In fact, I can remember a couple of years ago, we had some accrued actuarial liabilities, which were very modest. And our investment council had done so well one year. In fact, they were held up as, as the best in the nation that year. They had done so well that they took the, the re retirement fund trustees took the excess and completely paid off the accrued actuarial liabilities. And when the people who look at our comprehensive annual financial report saw the, they looked for the pension liability line and they saw an asset instead of a liability. And they were just completely confused because no states had such a thing as South Dakota did. So it's something we can be proud of. It's because of those practices, those funding recurring expenses with only recurring income, balancing our budget honestly, having a respectable 10% reserve, having our pension fully funded, having low debt, all those things caused in 20, See, it was 2015, S&P upgraded our credit rating to AAA, and then in 2016, last year, uh, both Moody's and Fitch's followed suit. And then last June, when the state's uh, building authority sold bonds to finance the new um, animal disease uh, research and diagnostic lab, 
Of course, all our credit agencies had to look into our finances again, and they reaffirmed, all three of them, reaffirmed our AAA credit rating with a stable outlook. So that's something about which we can be very proud. So these are some of the reasons why we're seeing success in economic development. And it's also thanks to the hard work of our governor's office of economic development and our partners around the state like Nate and other folks from the Vermilion Chamber and Development Company. <coughs> Excuse me. Our economic development leaders do the work of explaining why businesses should make investments in South Dakota if they're already here why they should expand here if they're not already here, why they should start a business here or start a new operation here. Um, for USD Founders Day, I was in Vermilion last April. I met with Nate and we went through some uh, prospects he was working on at the time. We also toured around. I, when I got here today, I went back to the uh, area where uh, Bliss Point, where you're building some new homes. In fact, started to go down one street and they were pouring concrete today. So I had to back up and, and turn around and go back the other way. So there's, uh, I know you're seeing success. Uh, I know sales have been better than projected. And so congratulations for that. I also saw downtown, you've got that active project underway to rehab that historic building. Saw that, uh, the workers there scurrying around behind the chain link fence. And uh, that'll add jobs to the, to the community. And I know uh, from my discussions uh, earlier in April that you've got some active prospects in the queue and that if things come together there could be some pretty significant e economic impact to Vermillion. So congratulations Nate and everyone who's been involved in, in that effort. Statewide I'm happy to report 2017 has been a good year for economic development. In January the Tennessee based manufacturer of burritos, quesadillas and other Mexican food, Reds All Natural, announced plans to establish a new food processing operation in North Sioux City that will add 45 new jobs there. In June a Netherlands based animal genetics company Hendrix Genetics announced plans to construct a $25 million commercial turkey hatchery in Beersford and they'll uh, create 79 new jobs. Get this, they will hatch more than half a million new turkeys every week. Half a million turkeys every week. And they'll go all over the country to uh, turkey barns where they'll be raised to uh, be placed on our dining room table at some point. In July, Sioux Falls based Gage Brothers, I know if you've been on I-29, you've gone by Gage Brothers 12th Street location many, many times as I have and you've seen their inventory all over the yard and you can imagine having been in that location as long as they've been, they're kind of cobbled together their multiple building, multiple location manufacturing process and that's not a good efficient manufacturing methodology today. So in July, Sioux Falls uh, based Gage Brothers announced a $40 million reinvestment. They're building a brand new building out near uh, the uh, Great Bear Ski Valley across the river from Great Bear Ski Valley and the building is about half, half up already. They're going to help Gage Brothers increase production by 60% and add about 20% to the existing workforce. In October, Omega Liner Company, which is a subsidiary of a Minnesota-based construction company, announced their plans to build a new manufacturing operation in Canton to produce uh, their proprietary culvert liners for the transportation industry. Uh, the new manufacturing plant will create 16 jobs in Canton. In November, a Minnesota-based animal feed company, Great Plains Processing, announced their expansion to Yankton, where they're going to produce custom spray-dried products. And their company intends to create 20 full-time jobs immediately, with probably doubling that in three to five years. In all, South Dakota, those are just a, a sampling of 40 projects in 2017, totaling over $690 million in new investment. I was talking with Steve Watkins, and their goal for next year is a billion dollars, and he thinks it's very likely they can meet that goal because of uh, good projects that they've got in queue. 
And all told, those 40 projects I mentioned, uh, a sampling of those, those 40 projects this year uh, looked like they could create about 1,200 new jobs in South Dakota over the next three years. So I'm very proud of our successes, very proud of South Dakota and the condition our state is in. We're not, we're not uh, zooming along at a breakneck, over-exuberant pace, but I think we're steadily increasing. The uh, agriculture economy and commodity prices are a little bit weaker than we'd like them to be, but that's the nature of agriculture and its cyclical uh, pricing. And we had the go-go years of 2011 and 2012 and 13, but then now 15, 16, 17, we've seen kind of the reversal of that. About the only commodity that we've seen growing steadily in its pricing over that period is lumber. If you look at lumber over 15, 16, ever since the recession ended, lumber prices have continued to crime, climb pretty steadily. Uh, conversely, every other commodity that we deal with in South Dakota has seen their prices retreat pretty drastically from those go-go years of 11, 12, 13, and, and um, part of 14. So, I'm hoping ag will, will uh, see some price improvement. We certainly hope ag will, we, we're glad to see uh, the corn production be better than we thought it would be in spite of uh, some pretty dry years. And um, we also escaped, in spite of the uh, Legion Lake fire that was uh, dominating the news last week, uh, we largely escaped the uh, dangerous fire conditions that the drought brought with them. To give you some perspective, last year we burned about 50,000 acres in South Dakota over the course of the year. We have many, many wildfires across the state in our grasslands and in our uh, uh, forest lands and we burned about 50,000 acres this year. It'll be more like 60,000 acres including the 54,000 acres uh, in the Legion Lake fire. In 2012, that drought year, we burned 220,000 acres in South Dakota. So that gives you some perspective in spite of a one large fire that we wish wouldn't occurred, uh, still we're, we're uh, not all that far off where we were last year. Uh, there is one area though that I wanted to talk to you about where South Dakota continues to struggle and that is uh, workforce. For employers, finding qualified workers is a common difficulty and if you just ask any employer in South Dakota, they will mention workforce as a challenge, if not the challenge that they face. As uh, the, uh, the Western Governors Association, which is the 19 governors of the states that are kind of west of the Missouri River, if you will, uh, they, had a, they found a barrel and they were scraping the bottom of it and they found me there and they named me their chair. So I'm chair of the Western Governors Association and uh, one of the things that the chair gets to do is pick a focus, pick an issue upon which all the governors of those 19 states will get together on and share staff information, share uh, problems and solutions. And the focus I have asked us to identify over the next uh, year is workforce. And uh, it's been a focus of mine in years past and it'll continue to be a focus this upcoming legislative session and throughout my last year in office. It is an area that uh, centers around education because it's clear that post-secondary education is very important in today's job market. If you go back, uh, Harvard did a study a few years ago entitled Pathways to Prosperity and that study looked back to 1973. I graduated in 1971 from high school and in 1973 when I was a sophomore right here at USD they looked back at what was the nature of the workforce who were, who were laboring in America at that time. And here's what they looked like. Those with a high school diploma or less like my dad comprised 72% of the workforce, nearly three quarters of the workforce at that time had a high school diploma or less. And going to uh, a university to get an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, it was a relatively uh, unusual thing when I started here. Last
last year, conversely, Georgetown University Center for Education and the Workforce found that today, only 34% of job holders are going to have a high school diploma or less. Two thirds are going to have some college or an associate's degree uh, or a bachelor's degree or better. And so the workforce uh, aptitudes or education, I should say, the education level of our workforce has gone up pretty considerably. And this trend toward workers with more than a high school diploma began in the early 2000s and has recently accelerated. And jobs for those with no post-secondary training are trending down, and trending down pretty quickly. Uh, in 2016, that same Georgetown University uh, Center for an Education and Workforce issued a document called America's Divided Recovery. And I'd commend you to that, America's Divided Recovery. College haves and have-nots. And it reported that the economy has added 11.6 million jobs since the recession bottomed out. 11.5 million of them, or 99%, have gone to workers with at least some post-secondary education. Of the 11.6 million jobs created during the recovery, graduate degree holders gained 3.8 million jobs, bachelor's degree holders gained 4.6 million jobs, associate's degree holders gained 3.1 million jobs, and workers with a high school diploma or less, only 80,000 jobs. Now you might think, well gosh, they're still getting some, but let's look at where they were before the recession. This chart shows the recession beginning in December of 07, and it carries it through April of last year. And this report came out in June, so this was pretty fresh. If you look at the bottom line, you can see workers with a high school diploma or less lost 5.6 million jobs during the uh, recession. And then since the recession ended, where the shaded part ends, you can see they've really just held their own. They've added 80,000, but it's virtually flat. A little bit of a modest roller coaster ride to that $80,000 gain. Whereas you compare the orange line, that's uh, those with uh, an associate's degree or some college. They gained a little bit. Oops. Let's see here. I do not want to change the color scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I think I must have bumped the, uh, uh, let's see, here we go. Gosh, this, uh, this does not want to move where I want it to move. Here we go. Well, there we go. <laughs> Bailey, I just had to come close. <laughs> the, uh, the orange line is uh, folks who have associate's degree or, or less, some college, I should say it that way, and associate's degree holders. And you can see they lost 1.8 million jobs, then they regained them, and, and then some. Those with a bachelor's or graduate degree, they're the ones that really never lost jobs. They, they flattened out and held their own till the end of the recession and then they've added a considerable number of jobs since then. So given this, of course, we want to keep our kids from dropping out of high school, certainly, help them graduate from high school, and, but then we need to encourage them to pursue some post-secondary education because a high school diploma today is no longer enough. It's no longer enough and if this chart doesn't make that point, I don't know what point it makes. So of course, those are things we're already encouraging in South Dakota. We're encouraging kids to finish high school. We're encouraging them to go on to post-secondary uh, training. So how are we doing? How are we doing? Well, I saw a chart in Colorado that made me wonder, I wonder what a chart like that looks like for South Dakota. And what they did in Colorado is they went back 10 years and looked at a group of ninth graders and say, these ninth graders started high school 
four years later, how many of them graduated? And then six years later, how many of them had graduated from some post-secondary training? Maybe they went to a four-year university, maybe they went to a two-year university, but let's look at them six years later, because that's the way a lot of our post-secondary institutions consider that is the mark at which they're considered to have attained graduation or not. Now back, back when I went to the U, we could actually graduate in four years, but nowadays students, I mean, why postpone that extended adolescent period? You know, why truncate it? Why truncate it when you can extend it? So anyway, kids go five years or six years, but that's kind of the goal now. If you look at university graduation rates, it's pretty consistent nationwide to use a six-year mark and say, if you haven't graduated by six years, you're probably not going to. <laughs> so let's take a 10-year period, I said, in South Dakota, and let's go back to 2006 and look at our ninth graders. Back in 2006, we had 10,513 ninth graders in public schools in South Dakota. And um, to make the numbers easy, let's pretend there's a hundred of them. A hundred of them started high school in 20, uh, 2006. Four years later, 77 of them had graduated, 23 had dropped out. It's pretty consistent if you look at high school students, about 70% these days are going on to some post-secondary training, about 70%. They might be going to Augustana, like one of the young people here. They might be going to Lake Area Tech, like one of the young people here, but some kind of post-secondary. And the others, they go to military, they go right into the workforce. But this was true of the South Dakota uh, ninth graders, about 52% enrolled in college of some kind, college, tech school, some kind of post-secondary, but only about 23 of them obtained a credential in South Dakota. About 10 more of them went, uh, transferred out of state and finished elsewhere. But the bottom line is you can see out of 100, we have quite a few that weren't finishing high school and those that were finishing high school weren't going on and we know from that prior chart, those who just have a high school credential, they're going to have a tough go in the job market. And even those who went on, and this is pretty true nationwide, of those who pursue post-secondary education, nationwide and in South Dakota, only about 60% complete. Only about 60% complete. So maybe 30 out of 100. Now, we're doing better today. We're doing better today. Today's high school graduation rate is not 77%. Last spring, we graduated over 90% of those who started high school graduated. So we're doing a lot better. But the 60% mark is still about right in South Dakota. And it varies. USD and SDSU are a little bit, uh, maybe a shade better. Some of our other universities, not as good. Our, uh, our two-year uh, tech schools are pretty good as compared to most two-year schools in the nation. Uh, Lake Area Tech, for example, I think their graduation rate last year was 73%, very high for a two-year school, very high. So we're doing better, but the point is we need to encourage our young people to graduate from high school and then we need to encourage them urgently to pursue and complete some post-secondary training that gives them an opportunity in the job market. Because employers are increasingly using a post-secondary credential as a screen. Even if you really don't need that bachelor's degree in this or that, they're looking to that as a screen for someone who can complete things they start, and maybe the training they got at college is completely irrelevant to the job. Maybe the incumbent job holders that are peers for that opening don't have a degree, but they're using the four-year degree or a two-year degree as a screen. And they won't even consider the high school diploma holder because there are plenty of post-secondary degree holders who are competing. 
Today in South Dakota, we have about 16,000 job openings and we have about 16,000 people who are unemployed. Now, how do you get to be unemployed? You answer a survey. If I'm going to school full time, some people will say, well, Dugard's not employed, he's unemployed. But if I'm not actively looking for a job and ready to work, I'm not considered unemployed. Okay, and so if I look and look and look and I get so discouraged I quit looking, I'm not unemployed. Okay, that's not the way you count. You only count the unemployed, those who are looking and ready to work now. So there's different versions, but the unemployment number that you hear most widely publicized, that's the definition of the unemployed. So we've got 16,000 unemployed, ready to work, actively looking. We have 16,000 job openings today, and the, they don't match because those who are looking don't have the skill sets that the uh, employers who have openings are seeking. So we need to do a better job uh, and shame on me, this revelation uh, that this gave to me, this light bulb that turned on my head, just turned on within the last six months or a year. And so, uh, as Senator Rush pointed out, I've got one more year to go and I'm going to try to um, raise the awareness of this among young people and parents uh, and really the general public. But most importantly, we need to make sure our young people understand this, that uh, they, they are making choices today that will make their ability to get a good job tomorrow uh, and sometimes they don't really fully appreciate it. You know, when, let's see if I can get back there. When this was me, when this was me, one of that uh, light green pie chart pieces, I could come to USD and pick any old major I wanted probably because I was so, I was in such an exclusive club back in those days, three quarters of the people against whom I would compete wouldn't have that degree. And so I was really, I could pretty much choose political science as I did or whatever. And I could do it without regard to what the job market was like. Today, uh, it's a little tougher. So uh, we have to be more attentive. If you're going to choose a job or an academic degree for which there aren't a lot of job prospects, you need to be very careful about how you distinguish, distinguish yourself from the masses of others who have that same degree. So we're graduating a ton of psychology majors. If I'm going to major in psychology, I better figure out a way to distinguish myself from the crowd, because there's a crowd like that. And yet we know I can't just be this. I can't be a high school diploma holder alone. I've got to get some kind of post-secondary degree uh, to be in the job market and competitive. So, I don't have a proposed solution. I know that we need to open up more pathways to young people. We need to give them more career counseling information. We need to give them more uh, taste testing of job opportunities and careers that are available in South Dakota and elsewhere so they can understand what the, what the opportunities are like and, and, and uh, hopefully they'll, they'll succeed and do well. But thank you for uh, the opportunity to visit with you today. Um, it's one o'clock. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> thank you again for your uh, insight and your leadership. And uh, I think I can give this to you publicly, <laughs> you right? Can, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for a part of Rotary Year, being a part of it. Thank you so much. And one other thank you from the ESA uh, Theta Omega chapter for uh, your contributions for the Christmas gifts uh, to the needy here in Vermilion. Thank you for that. We'll just say thank you for all the guests that are here. Appreciate you being here. And uh, Governor and Linda, thank you for being a part of us uh, for us today. Uh, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and stand. My country, tis of the sweet land of liberty.
beauty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring.